This, this is our favorite cell, and I hope that uh, all of you have <laughs> not only have neutrophils, but that they are happy neutrophils, like this one. So um, you've heard a lot from, um, I'm sure, over the years, and just now from Dr. Voxer about um, neutropenia and and its risks. And the primary risk of not having neutrophils is um, the risk of having an infection. And so the natural reaction of every patient and physician is, what can I do to prevent infections? And my talk will basically be first about, um, is prevention of infections necessary? What is, and if it's necessary, what is sufficient and what is too much, um, because too much of a good thing is not good. And um, then I'll also get on to some of the other um, um, issues in terms of health maintenance with or without neutropenia. But um, I think the most important message that I'll start with and finish with is that um, some preventive measures are reasonable for someone with neutropenia. But if someone has a diagnosis of neutropenia, but it's either resolved or adequately treated, the message is to live a normal life. And that is the idea of treatment with Neupogen or rarely other treatments, to normalize life. That not, you don't have to be worrying about neutropenia all the time. And in fact, that's sometimes an indication to go on to Neupogen for something like um, autoimmune neutropenia of infancy when it's not essential as a life-saving measure, but it makes life a lot more easy not to be worrying about it all the time. And then in between, with, um, with uh, <clears throat> neutropenic, but not normal, but um, some level of ANC I'll talk about, um, it depends on what level you have and the mechanism of neutropenia. And as Dr. Boxer mentioned, there's less risk with autoimmune and idiopathic than with congenital. Now, this is this table that Dr. Boxer showed you and that one of us shows every year at this talk. And every um, hematologist um, goes by it. And these are the levels of risk with different levels of, of ANC. But there's important um, caveats to this table. As Dr. Boxer mentioned, the risk also depends on the duration of neutropenia. A short time with a given level has less risk than a long time at a given level. And the mechanism, as he said, destruction, such as autoimmune, is lower risk than lack of production. So it's important to remember that this table was derived from studies with cancer patients receiving chemotherapy. So they had a risk not just from neutropenia, but they also had immune suppression from the chemotherapy, often poor nutrition, central venous catheters, pieces of plastic going into their veins, and organ damage from cancer. So these numbers are probably somewhat exaggerated, especially at these intermediate levels, um, because they were derived from patients who didn't just have neutropenia which is the case with most people in this room, but they had other immune deficits. So it's important to remember that the neutrophil is not the only defense you have against infection. Um, there are surface barriers, skin, mucous membranes, the lungs and the GI tract have very good barriers against infection. The reticuloendothelial system, liver and spleen, as Dr. Boxer mentioned, you want to keep a spleen if you can, because that's an important defense against infection. There's also the whole other part of the immune system. The neutrophil is called part of the innate immune system. It doesn't care whether you've seen the bug before. It's going to attack the bug and kill it. But you also have the, what's called the acquired immune system, antibodies, complement, and all these other cells, T and B cells and NK cells, monocytes and macrophages, which learn what a pathogen is and learn how to attack it. And all of those aspects of the immune system are generally intact in an individual, in an individual with neutropenia. So you're not without an immune system. You're missing one piece. 
So I'd now like to move on to the issue of um, germs. So neutrophils fight germs. And so does that mean that all germs are bad and you need to be protected against all germs? So are you under constant attack? And the answer is um, that most bacteria are already there. They're inside you. There's something called the microbiome. And in fact, you have about 100 trillion microscopic life forms living in you and on you. And uh, in fact, you have 10 times as many microbial cells as human cells in your body. And they may not be happy about being so crowded, but in fact, most of them are your friends. And each body part has its own set of microbes that are happily living there. Um, each color represents a different kind of bacterium. And in fact, you have different ones in your nose and your ear canal. Um, even your toe spaces have different group of bacteria from your heel. I won't go into the gluteal crease in great detail here. Um, but in fact, the point is that each body part has its own set of bugs. And those are a normal part. And in fact, they form a barrier to bad bugs. You have these commensal organisms that help you and you help them. And it's good to keep them intact. So this leads to the hygiene hypothesis that, that dirt is good. And every two-year-old, of course, knows that, that dirt is good and fun to play in. And um, there's a, a fairly well-established um, theory now that if you are too clean, if you don't have a good exposure to normal bacteria, you're much more likely to have allergic and autoimmune diseases than if you have a nice, friendly relationship with your bacterial flora. And like every scientific idea, it has already been made into, the, into a diet, the microbiome diet. And believe it or not, there are now experiments that are very promising with fecal transplants for people with, with gut diseases, that if you don't have a good set of bacteria in your gut, you can have them transplanted from somebody who has a good set of bacteria. Something I actually proposed as an intern many years ago, but it was considered too yucky for uh, <laughs> clinical trials. Um, so what are the lessons from the microbiome? Most microbes are your friends. They're not your enemies. Excessive hygiene removes your friends and opens the door to invaders. And chronic or frequent use of antibiotics alters the microbiome and actually encourages the growth of bad and antibiotic-resistant organisms. So what about the bad bugs? They're, you know, they're not all good. Not all bacteria are your friends. So lessons from hospital studies are, first of all, what are effective precautions for patients who are immune suppressed in the hospital, which is a, an environment full of bad bugs? Hand washing, that's the, the, the sine qua non of um, infection prevention. Good hand washing. Then there's laminar airflow and HEPA filtration, um, high efficiency particle arrest. And that's what is done for patients who have absolutely no immune system, such as those going through bone marrow transplant. And anything else in between is not very effective. So the neutropenic diet um, has no proven efficacy. You don't want to know what it is, because it, <laughs> um, it's, there's things like um, you know, raw vegetables people uh, are sometimes warned against. So basically, you, know, you, you want to wash your vegetables, but you can eat them. Um, their um, gowns, gloves, and so forth are important for doctors not to transmit an infection from one person to another, but they're not very effective for an individual to prevent getting infection um, from a normal environment. Um, prophylactic antibiotics do more harm than good because they 
um, get rid of the normal microbiome. And not studied, but by implication, is disinfecting the home, disinfecting the playground, social isolation uh, are not going to protect you because most of the interactions that you have with the environment from um, other people from the playground and so forth are going to be either viruses for which you have normal defense from lymphocytes or just a host of the normal bugs that are on everybody's skin and um, <clears throat> in the normal environment. So most infections from neutro in neutropenic patients come from their own bacteria when some of the normal microbiome is replaced by bad bacteria. So what makes the good microbiome go bad? One is antibiotics. One is the hospital environment. That's why Dr. Boxer said keep those kids out of the emergency room, out of the hospital, because they're going to pick up aggressive bacteria, antibiotic-resistant bacteria in the hospital. Sometimes a good bug gets in a bad place. Um, if there's a break in the skin, a break in the um, mucous membrane of the mouth or the GI tract, then a good bug might get into the bloodstream where it can do bad business. Um, so it's important to keep the skin and the gums and the intestinal wall intact and keep the rest of the immune system intact, which is why we um, strongly recommend against the use of some treatments such as corticosteroids, prednisone, which can raise a neutrophil count, but it gets rid of the rest of the immune system. So it probably does more harm than good, except for a few very specific diseases. So what are reasonable precautions um, against infection? And I'll go into each of these in a little more detail. Um, mouth care is very important. I'll go into that. Immunizations and vaccinations, as Dr. Voxer said, very important. And a lot of doctors, primary care doctors, get mixed up about different kinds of immune deficiencies and say, oh, I don't want to immunize your child because he has neutropenia. Not true. General hygiene and um, foreign travel. So, mouth care. Um, you want your mouth to look more like this, not the surroundings, but just the mouth, than the one that Dr. Voxer showed you with the um, inflamed gums. So, what's reasonable? Avoid sweets, have regular dental checkups, have excellent oral hygiene with blush brushing and flossing. Um, sometimes a mouthwash is helpful, half water and half hydrogen peroxide. That's the antibacterial 3% hydrogen peroxide, not the hair dye 30% hydrogen peroxide. These are much better than the alcohol-based washes, the Listerine. If, if you believe that pain is good for you, then maybe use an alcohol-based wash. Um, although there are some studies that show that that actually increases the risk of, of oral cancer. And chlorhexidine um, is something that you should use if you like things that taste truly horrible. <laughs> but this is pretty benign, and, it, and it, it helps keep down bacteria around the teeth. Fluoride treatment. Um, Periodontal care for chronic gum inflammation. Don't let it go. Get to a periodontist. Um, because as Dr. Boxer said, chronic gum inflammation can eventually lead to tooth loss. Um, antibiotics for dental procedures? Probably not. Hasn't been studied well in this setting. But, and some dentists will insist on it. It's probably not a good idea because it, again, changes the microbiome and the normal flora. It's important for people with heart disease, but not for people with neutropenia. So almost all of these, if you think about it, are some, something that everybody should do. There's not a special precaution. It's just important to do it well. And the same with immunizations. Um, all routine immunizations, according to the standard schedule, are important. There's no increased risk from live virus infections in individuals 
with neutropenia. That's a characteristic of individuals with defects in the acquired immune system, severe uh, chronic, uh, severe um, combined immunodeficiency, cancer chemotherapy, but not neutropenia. But a lot of physicians get the two mixed up and will say, oh, everything but live virus. No, those are good for you. It's much better to have measles vaccine than have wild-type measles. And these diseases are all making a comeback because of the uh, anti-immunization movement. So, yes? Absolutely, because the vaccines, the response to vaccines are through lymphocytes, not neutrophils. And um, it's very important to have immunity against these um, severe infections like diphtheria, like measles, mumps, rubella. And the body um, handles those vaccines. You don't get vaccine-associated infections. Um, without neutrophils. You get those when you don't have lymphocytes. So thorough hand washing is a good idea for everybody. But excessive washing can actually damage the skin. I talked about not having breaks in the skin. If you wash your hands 20 times after every meal, you're going to get dry, broken skin. And that's not good. Wash, wash once. That's plenty. Good nail care cleaning of scrapes and cuts on the skin. So all of these are true for everybody. No rectal temp temperatures or suppositories. That's not necessarily true for everybody, although I know my grandchildren would prefer not to have them. Uh, so um, um, this is probably a good idea to avoid breaks in the mucosa, in the mucous membrane around the rectum. And for foreign travel, um, consult your physician, study the CDC <coughs> website, which, shows, which discusses precautions in various countries. But it's certainly having neutropenia n does not preclude foreign travel. And in fact, a lot of the, the discussion here is, um, that I've heard at various um, iterations of this meeting has been about how to travel with the syringes and neupogen supply. Uh, regular soap is pretty good. Is a pretty good antibacterial agent, so you don't have to get anything special. Soap and water are really magical. So social interactions and school attendance. So most infections that are transmitted from other people in in school and in work are viral infections, and uh, just as immunity for vaccines is normal in neutropenia, so immunity to viral infections is normal. So the viruses don't present any special risk. The catch to that is that sometimes a fever from a virus can lead to a doctor visit or an ER visit. And very rarely, a viral infection can open the door to what's called a secondary bacterial infection. So for instance, influenza can lead to pneumonia. And in fact, that's a good reason to get a flu shot every year. Um, so there is a little bit of a risk of catching a virus in the kindergarten. But you have to balance that risk against the psychosocial and educational benefits of going to school, of going to play groups, of going to work, of having social interactions. Um, so by and large, the balance falls on the side of living a normal life. Completely so if the neutrophil count is normal or near normal, but really true even if you're living with a low neutrophil count. Uh, it makes sense to avoid, obviously, sick friends and relatives. Um, don't let Uncle Joe cough in your face, but that's true for any of us. Um, so the take home message is with an adequate absolute neutrophil count, live as normal life as possible. With a low absolute neutrophil count, there are reasonable precautions, excellent mouth care and oral hygiene, all routine immunizations, good hand washing, and maintain school attendance and social interactions, and enjoy travel. Come to Seattle. 
Um, and um, as I've mentioned multiple times, these measures are good for everybody. So here's a neutrophil question. And um, I don't think we have time right now, but um, catch me in the hallways, catch me at the individual sessions. Thank you.